And the last thing we're going to study in this chapter are one-to-one -one functions. Okay, so first of all, what is a one-to-one -one function? It is a function. By definition, it has to be a function whose inverse whose inverse is also a function. Okay, so to be a one-to-one -one function, first you have to be a function, then you find his inverse. Oh, and his inverse is also a function. That makes him one-to-one. -one. Okay, true or false? To be a one-to-one -one function, you must first be a function. True, of course. So don't even do all this work to see if he's a one-to-one -one function, if he's not even a function to begin with. Okay, find the inverse. So every equation can have an inverse, but the function and the inverse, they might not be functions themselves. So first, to find an inverse, okay, remember what we do? First, we have to switch x and y. So instead of saying y equals, it's going to say x equals y squared minus 5. And then step 2, we're going to solve for y. So I'm going to add the 5 to the other side, y squared. And then I'm going to go ahead and square root. And y equals the square root of x plus 5. Now, hang on, there's a couple of things here that I don't like about this. First of all, when you square root, do you remember what you get? Plus and minus. Okay, that's going to totally make a difference with getting the rest of the function. Second of all, this is inverse, and so you have to use the correct notation for inverse. F inverse of x is plus and minus the square root of x plus 5. So here's the inverse. And the function was up here. Here's the function itself. Okay, and we're going to examine its graph to determine if the inverse is a function. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll graph the pink one, x squared minus 5. x squared minus 5. And let's see, this graph paper is 7 by 7. So let's change our window to be negative 7 by 7. And then our calculator will match our graph paper. So x squared, of course, is a parabola. It's down how many? Oh, it's down negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We're going to really start look at that next chapter, see how it's negative 5. Okay, and that's a parabola opening up. Parabola opening up. Okay, it's crossing right there at 2 point something between the 2 and the 3. All right, so this one is the original one. I'm going to call him f of x. And now it's time to graph the inverse. To graph the inverse. But to graph the inverse, I need to type two equations. So what we're going to have to use here is y2 and y3. So y2 will be the square root of x plus 5. And then y3 will be the negative square root of x plus 5. Make sure the negative is this little one way down here. Okay, so I've already got the parabola graph. Let's go see what it says about the inverse. So well, there's the first piece, and there's the second piece. It's a parabola opening to the right. And what number is that? 1, 2, 3, negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5. And this parabola is going like this. And like this. And this is f inverse of x. Remember what's always kind of nice to graph just to see if it actually is working is the line that is a reflection for the two of them. So the line y equals x, that line should go right through the middle. And if you were to fold your paper right along this line, the line y equals x, they should match up. That little vertex right there should match up that vertex. And they do. They fold up this little arrow, would match up to that arrow right there. Okay, so these are inverses. We did a really good job. But now they ask us a question about the inverse. So look at the green one. Is this inverse 
also a function. And by doing the vertical line test, we can determine no, the inverse is not passing. So there is a way to do a shortcut. Okay, If you looked at this parabola, he was a function. But then we did all the work, we found the inverse, we graphed the inverse, and we did a vertical line test on him. Instead of doing all that work, what you could do is you could look at the original one and you could do a different test on him. If you had looked at the original pink parabola and done horizontal lines on him, you would have had your answer. So the horizontal line test is like a shortcut. There's a shortcut, the horizontal line test. Okay, what does this test determine? It determines if a function's if a function's inverse will be a function. So without even finding the inverse, can you tell me what the answer is going to be? Okay? So to perform the horizontal the horizontal line test Okay, what you do is you draw horizontal lines, horizontal lines, okay, but be careful about this. Where do you draw the horizontal lines? On the original f of x, on the original f of x. So without even seeing the inverse, without even doing any of this work, you look at the original one and you do horizontal line tests. And that is predicting the future. That's predicting the answer of the inverse being a function. So there's two ways you could do this. You could take the original one, do horizontal line tests, and tell me if it works. Or you could calculate the inverse, graph the inverse, do verticals on him, and then you could tell me if he's a function. So the horizontal line test will tell you if the function's inverse will be a function without even finding it. So here's some graphs, and we're going to do it the shortcut way. Okay, this is a function, right? Determine if this graph is one-to-one. -one. So what that means is the inverse, is the inverse a function? Without even seeing the inverse, let's predict. So you do horizontal lines on him, and he is not one-to-one. -one. Is this one a function? Yes. Is he one-to-one? -one? Let's see. If I do horizontal lines, nope. This one is not one-to-one. -one. Okay, this is a function. Is he a one-to-one -one function? Yes. Yes, he is one-to-one. -one. So if I found his inverse, and if I graphed the inverse, he would be a function. Okay. So it's a nice test without having to do all the work. Uh, let's talk about domain and range of functions and inverses. Okay, and here's a little visual for you just to help you understand what's going on here. Here is a set of domain. So all of this right here is going to be the domain. Domain means input. Domain goes in. Here's f. The f function goes this way. You put in these numbers into the domain, and out comes all of these. So what is this bubble representing? This bubble represents the range. So domain to range. But now look at this. This is inverse. This is inverse. Inverse goes backwards. So inverse starts right here. So this bubble, which was the range for f, becomes the domain for f inverse. So f inverse has this domain, f inverse goes backwards, goes this way, and this domain for f, that's his range. So they have the same numbers, in, out. The ins become the outs, and the outs become the ins. So the domain for f is the range for f inverse. And the range of f over here is the domain for f inverse. So they have the same numbers. The inputs become the outputs. 
Okay, let's find the inverse of this guy. I know we've done one like this before, but it's really important that we do it again because this is the one that people uh, struggle with a little bit. So to find an inverse, step one, let's switch x and y. This f of x, that's a really fancy y, so that will become x equals 2y plus 1 over y minus 1. Do you see why they say x can't equal a 1? Because they don't want the denominator to be 0. So that's like domain. Okay, so here comes the inverse. I'm just going to label my work. Okay, step 2, solve for y. So we're going to put x over the only number you're allowed to put down there, a 1. Okay, and we're going to cross multiply. So 2y plus 1 equals, let's cross this way, don't forget to distribute, x, y, minus x. Okay, now we're solving for y. But oh my goodness, there's y's all over the place. It might be a good idea to put them all on one side. Let's put them all on the left. 2y minus xy, because when you switch sides, you switch signs. Where's that positive 1 going to go? To the right, a positive 1 will become a negative 1. Okay, well, at least they're all on one side. There's still too many y's. So what are we going to do here? When in doubt, factor it out. Let's factor out the y, since they both have 1. Do you see how there's only one y now? Okay, but I'm still a little confused. How am I supposed to make this be y equals? That's right, you divide by that quantity right there. Divide both sides by the quantity, and then we get y equals. So we have negative 1 minus x and 2 minus x. But hang on, we're not going to say y. Remember, this is an inverse. Let's use the proper notation f inverse of x. Now, depending if you move things to the right or the left, there's another equivalent answer. If you move things to the right, your answer would be uh, x plus 1 over x minus 2. And what that is is the top getting multiplied by negative and the bottom by negative. So there's a couple of answers here depending on which way you cross multiply, but these are equivalent. Okay, so some people's answers might look different than yours, but they're the same. Okay, now we're going to answer some domain and range questions. The easiest question out of all of these is probably the domain of f. So we look at the original f. Domain has a denominator. Denominator cannot equal 0. So it's all reals except x cannot equal a 1. Okay, now the next easiest question on this whole page, okay, would be the range. The domain of f, hey, where's that, where's that diagram? The domain of f, that's the same bubble of numbers as the range of f inverse. So domain of f is the same as the range of f inverse. All reals except, wait, we can't say x for range. You have to say y cannot equal 1. Oh, that's tricky right there. Yep, some people will accidentally put x and x. Remember, domain is x, range is y. Okay, now I know that these two answers are going to be the same. Domain for the inverse is the range of the original, and that would be this bubble up here. The domain for the inverse is the range of f. So I think it would be easiest if we just look at f, and then we could say the domain. So the domain of this guy right here is all reals except x cannot equal 2. Okay, And I know that that answer is going to be the same as here. So it's all reals except, go ahead and write it down. Now, did you write down y cannot equal 2? Okay, be careful. There's another trick. Make sure the range gets y's, the domain get, gets x's. Okay, uh, this last one right here is some composing. Let's just make sure we still remember how to do it. I don't like this kind of notation. I like f of g of x. 
So let's write f of, and what's the g of x? Let's put something else in here. Negative 2 over x. And that function has to go into f. What does f say? He says 1 divide by input plus 3. So that's going to be 1 divided by input plus 3. Okay, and how do you add fractions? We're going to have to make some common denominators here. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by an x. So now we have 1 divided by, the common denominator here is x, and the numerator is, I'm going to write 3x minus 2. Okay, remember how to handle a triple decker? So we're going to go ahead and clean that up. And we're going to get x divided by 3x minus 2. Okay. Now, this one also said, and find its domain. So now we've got to do the domain. But remember, domain of a composed is not just looking. We have two steps. So let's go for the domain. Okay, step one, domain of the little guy. So let's look at g and tell me the domain x cannot equal a 0. Step 2, the little guy, g, must obey f. So let's write down g. The little function g must obey f. Does f have any, any restrictions? He says do not equal negative 3. Let's go ahead and cross multiply there x cannot equal cross cross divide divide 2 thirds. So let's go ahead and combine our two steps. The domain is all reals except x cannot equal 0 comma or 2 thirds. Please remember that the domain of a composed function has to have two steps in order to do it the right way. Okay, make sure you're studying hard for that test coming up.